This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Vatican City is a tiny speck of a city-state located in the heart of Rome. It's only one kilometer wide at its widest point. Not the kind of place that would need a robust transportation system worthy of a real city. And yet, there's a lot happening in that small space. Did you know Vatican City has its own gas station? It's right here in the shadow of St. Peter's Basilica. Apparently the prices aren't posted, but it's significantly cheaper than nearby Roman stations. Only Vatican City residents and employees have the privilege of filling up there. The city has electric vehicles covered too. There are numerous charging stations in the Vatican's parking lots. And surprisingly, there are a lot of parking lots. According to my back of the napkin math, about 6% of the city's land area is for car parking. Kind of a lot for a city without much space. This is no doubt because only about 450 people actually live in the city, so most employees commute in. The Pope even gets around by car once in a while, driving an old 1984 Renault 4. Most vehicles enter and exit via the main gate at Via Santana and can then access the street network within the Vatican. Many of the streets weave through the elaborate Vatican gardens, but the streets and buildings form a tiny bit of urban fabric in the northeast corner. Vatican City is also home to the smallest national rail system in the world, the famous Vatican Railway. It's a spur line that connects the Vatican's train station to the nearby Roma San Pietro's train station, and from there onto the larger European network. The spur and station were initially envisioned to carry religious pilgrims to the city, but today it's primarily used for freight, with only the occasional special guest getting a ride to the 90-year-old austere train station building. There is no airport in Vatican City, as you might expect, but there is a heliport located here, in the far western end of the city. This is primarily used to transport the Pope via Italian military helicopter, to a summer retreat at Castel Gandolfo. These trips have been much less frequent with the current Pope, who never even stays the night over there. One can access Vatican City by a wide variety of transportation, just like any major city. But there's more to a city than just its street network. I must admit that before researching this video, I kind of assumed the Vatican consisted of St. Peter's, the museums, and the palace. This video goes deep into all of the utilities, services, shops, government buildings, and yes, churches that make Vatican City a true city. Let's begin with the treaty that started it all after the bike bell. Vatican City as we know it today was formalized in the Lateran Treaty of 1929. It defined the relationship between the country of Italy and the Holy See, the sovereign entity of the Catholic Church ruled by the Pope. The two parties drafted a map that they both agreed upon, and the treaty went into some detail about how this new city-state would work in relation to both Italy and the surrounding city of Rome. One critical piece of the treaty includes stipulations about Holy See property outside of Vatican City. Major basilicas like St. John in Lateran, Santa Maria Maggiore, and St. Paul's outside the walls, as well as other assorted buildings belong to the Holy See, remain in Italy, but essentially have embassy status. In this video, I'm going to focus on the city itself and ignore the extraterritorial claims of the Pope. There are a few weird parts in Vatican City, though. St. Peter's Square, the massive public space lined by Bernini's colonnade, must be open to the public and policed by Italian police. The Italian police, however, have no power after stepping onto the stairs leading to St. Peter's. The other weird little part of Vatican City is this area, home to part of an auditorium, a church, and an office building. It's like one of those extraterritorial embassies, only immediately adjacent to Vatican City. Practically speaking, it is part of the city. Now that we understand the legal boundaries of the city, we can move on to the essentials, public utilities. There are about 450 residents of the city, along with a much larger group of employees, and yet another even larger group of daily visitors. Nearly 7 million people visited Vatican City in 2019. When the toilets flush in the Vatican Museum, or the Papal Apartment, where does the waste go? Does the Vatican have a wastewater treatment facility? What about electricity? There are solar panels on some of the roofs. Is that enough to make the Vatican City self-sufficient? The short answer is no. Vatican City is not and was not designed to be completely self-sufficient. And nobody would want to smell a coal power plant, landfill, and wastewater treatment plant while looking up at the Sistine Chapel. The Lateran Treaty states that, Italy shall provide, by means of suitable agreements entered into with the interested parties, that an adequate water supply be fully assured to the Vatican City. It shall equally also provide for the coordination of all other public services. Basically, Vatican City is reliant on Italy for its basic utilities, and Italy has to provide them to the Vatican. Though the treaty doesn't get more specific than that on the relationship, and things haven't always gone smoothly. For example, for years after the treaty, Vatican City's wastewater just dumped untreated into the Tiber River. 
In the 1980s, Italy passed a law making wastewater treatment mandatory in an effort to clean up its rivers. Rome's utility agency, ASEA, built treatment plants around the city, and now most of the Vatican City's wastewater is treated here at this facility. So what's wrong with that? Well, the treaty didn't really specify if Vatican City should pay the utility company for its services. Remember, at the time of the treaty, the sewage just ended up in the Tiber, which was free. You can imagine which interpretation each side chose. As far as I can tell, both sides agree that the water should be free, but they can't agree on wastewater treatment, and the Holy See still refuses to pay. Electricity is more or less the same story. Italy provides for the Vatican's electric supply. To its credit, Vatican City gets all of its electricity from renewable sources and has begun to generate power on site through its rooftop solar arrays. It's not producing enough to be self sufficient, but it's definitely better than nothing. The last major utility to talk about is trash. Vatican City generates about 1,000 tons of trash each year. Obviously, it doesn't have a landfill, and all waste is eventually shipped out of the city state. A few years ago, the city set up an eco center to sort out up to 85 different types of waste for eventual recycling. I didn't read anything that told me where this center is located, but my best guess is over here, maybe? Or maybe near the greenhouses and what I think are warehouses? Pope Francis, if you're watching this and you know the answer, drop it in the comments. Okay, we've gone through the basic utilities that make a city work, but what about services? Things like education, police, and fire? Vatican City definitely has their version of those. Now, as far as I can tell, no kids go to school in Vatican City, and there may not even be any kids. It kind of makes sense as most people there take vows of celibacy. There is one institution of higher learning, the Ethiopian College, located in a plum spot right in the heart of the Vatican Gardens. This institution trains students from Ethiopia and Eritrea to become members of the clergy. The Vatican used to have other colleges within the walls, but now they reside elsewhere throughout Rome. Vatican City is also home to the Vatican Library and its extensive world-class Vatican museums. This massive complex contains some of the Western tradition's most priceless pieces of art and literature, including the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo and some of the oldest Christian texts around. It would be a shame if all those priceless artifacts went up in smoke, which is why the Vatican has its own fire department. It's located in the Belvedere Courtyard, which makes it very close to the aforementioned artifacts. The station's equipment is pint-sized to match the narrow streets and openings of Vatican City's road network, and the firefighters are often called in to rescue tourists who can't complete the trip up and down the stairs of the Dome of St. Peter's Basilica. This being the Vatican, new recruits must be Catholic, male, unmarried, and celibate, and their celibacy must be affirmed by a Roman Catholic priest. If the celibacy thing isn't for you, you could join up with the Vatican police force, known as the Gendarmerie of Vatican City. All of the other requirements still apply, though. These folks do all the basic police tasks, like criminal investigation, border control, and traffic control. They're different than the Swiss Guard, who are tasked with protecting the Pope in his palace. The Vatican police also don't have to wear those subtle, tasteful Swiss Guard uniforms. Both the police force and the Swiss Guard have headquarters located within Vatican City. The last public service worth mentioning is parks. Over half of Vatican City's land area is parkland, specifically the Vatican Gardens. This is one of the few parts of the Vatican, not including St. Peter's and the museums, that you can actually visit as a non-citizen. There are some guided tours. There are three different types of gardens, Italian, English, and French, and they include statuary, the remains of a medieval wall, and those trees pruned into cubes. They're a perfect place for some spiritual meditation and fresh air. But what about active recreation, like sports fields and playgrounds? There is a tennis court tucked away in the northeast corner of the Vatican, though it lacks a net in the recent satellite photo suggesting it's not getting much use. There's also playground equipment right next to it, with swings and maybe a trampoline. The areas around the tennis court and playground are more mysterious. Are these bocce courts or some other kind of recreation space? This looks like a turf surface of some kind. Again, Pope Francis, let me know in the comments. Vatican City does have a soccer league, the Vatican City Championship, consisting of eight teams. The teams are formed from various departments of the Vatican bureaucracy like the museum staff and the off-site hospital. There is no soccer stadium within the Vatican City, and they play their games over here instead. The best of each team have occasionally formed a Vatican City national team for rare friendlies, but Vatican City is not a FIFA member. Thus far, we've focused on municipal utilities and services, but what about the day-to-day -day life within the walls? Does it feel like a city? Can you go get a coffee or a pint? Can you go to the supermarket? The answer to all these questions, for the most part, is yes. Coffee can be found at the Vatican Museum's cafeteria and at a little-known coffee bar on the roof of St. Peter's Basilica. 
but these are mostly tourist oriented spots. And as far as I know, there aren't any cafes designed for locals. The cafeteria also serves beer, if that's your thing. Other than the cafeteria, there are no restaurants in the city. Though there are plenty just outside Vatican City, and I'm sure many residents and employees venture out for a meal. If they don't feel like a restaurant, they can go to the supermarket. There are no taxes or duties, so the items are about one-third cheaper than in Italian supermarkets. Priests and nuns from all over Rome stock up here, not just those living in Vatican City. They can also shop at the nearby drugstore, which carries your typical medicine, but also some high-end beauty products. There's also a small duty-free shop located in the Vatican train station. Otherwise, the only shopping to be done in the Vatican City is at the museum gift shop. Needless to say, Vatican City residents will need to be leaving the city to get their other essentials or shop online. Luckily, the Vatican City post office is there to deliver packages. Now, every city needs a city hall, and Vatican City is no exception. It's called the Palace of the Governate, and it's located directly behind St. Peter's. And directly behind the palace is another church. In fact, there are several other churches and chapels located within Vatican City. You think that the world's largest church will be enough for the world's smallest country? But when the city's primary industry is religion, well, that's what happens. The primary industry, if you could call it that, of Vatican City is supporting and extending Catholicism throughout the world, and there are several key buildings that make that happen. They include two buildings that house the Vatican Radio, which broadcasts in 47 languages worldwide via radio, satellite, and the internet. The northeast section of the city is also home to the Vatican Press, another way the city spreads its religious message worldwide. There are clearly lots of jobs in the Vatican, including places I haven't even mentioned, like the Vatican Bank and the Treasury. But where do people live? Well, the Apostolic Palace is the ceremonial home of the Pope in one of the major buildings in the city. The current Pope doesn't actually live there, however. He's taken up residence in the Domus Sancta Marthe, a guest house for visiting clergy. It was built to house the College of Cardinals during papal conclaves while they chose new popes. The Archpriest of St. Peter's Basilica gets his own special residence, as does the head gardener of the Vatican Gardens. The Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI, lives in a former convent. The Swiss Guard lives in their barracks, and there are other assorted apartments and residences scattered throughout the city. For example, there are staff quarters in the Apostolic Palace for the nuns who run the papal household. But otherwise, not a lot of housing in Vatican City. It's quite the job's housing imbalance. The Holy See probably doesn't see this as a problem so long as the Pope has a place to stay. Now, we've already covered most of the structures in the Vatican Gardens, but we've neglected one. Casina Pio IV, home of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. This may be one of the most surprising institutions located in this city, an independent institute dedicated to the sciences with no religious agenda. The members of the academy are scientists from around the world, formally appointed by the Pope and serve there for life. There are currently 80 members of the academy. If you want to become a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, you may need to improve your math skills. I mean, they don't let in just anybody. A great way to get started with this is the new Everyday Math course over at Brilliant. This course presents foundational math concepts in a fun, interactive way and prepares you to take other fantastic STEM courses. Everyone can benefit from this course, me included. I'm working on math homework with my fifth grader most nights, and Brilliant's review of fractions was a big help for me. They demonstrate fractions in a visual way and use interactivity to reinforce learning. I'm able to refresh my own knowledge and be a better parent tutor. And Brilliant is more than just everyday math. They bring their visual interactive style to other STEM topics like programming fundamentals, physics, and calculus. Brilliant's courses can help you reach your learning goals faster with much more fun than other methods. And don't worry if you're busy. Lessons are presented in bite-sized pieces so you can learn at your own pace in a no-pressure environment. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org citybeautiful or click on the link on screen and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.